everything you have given to each one of us. Thank you for the Sabbath. Thank you for the week of prayer we've had. Now I pray that your blessing will be upon the speaker as he brings to us the message. We pray for those around the world that are meeting in very terrible times. We pray that they will receive your spirit too. So today, we leave all to thy knees, in thy, thy hands, and I pray that your presence will be with us to try to touch our hearts and bring us closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, thank you, Quintet. In case you didn't notice, that guy up here with the whiskers was not Johnny Baker, although I hear Johnny's got a few whiskers coming. But uh, he did, uh, he, Johnny was down here on the front playing, that's why he couldn't, uh, he couldn't be a part. I want to welcome all those that are sitting in our pews today. So I'm glad to have you here. Also like to welcome all those that are watching via the internet. Maybe if it's your first time uh, tuning in, if it is, uh, we're glad to have you uh, part of our service here today. I'm pleased to be able to share our pulpit with Adam Mead. Pastor Adam, thank you for coming here today. Um, last week, the last couple weeks, uh, Pastor Daniel Sanchez from the Dominican Republic welcomed me to his pulpit and he made me feel very at home. And I'm grateful that we have a worldwide church that we do such things as share our pulpits. In fact, I'm so grateful. Uh, our pastors, when we went to the Dominican Republic the last couple of weeks, we were able to purchase land, contract a church to be built for a brand new congregation, and we baptized 150 people into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I know there's about another 200, 250 that are in baptismal classes as a result. So thank you, each and every one of you, for allowing your pastor and for allowing me to go share the good news, the gospel of Jesus. Just a moment, I'm going to be reading from the book of Daniel. You can turn there if you like. But first, I'd like to share just a couple things about Pastor uh, Adams. He's followed his father's footsteps, second generation pastor. He's also a product of Christian education, such as Union Springs Academy. He graduated from Pine Forge Academy, Oakwood University, and finally, he received his Master's of Divinity at Andrews University. He is married to his uh, wife, Shana, of almost two and a half years, I believe I heard you say. And he's currently serving as youth pastor in the Washington, D.C. area and uh, serving the Allegheny East Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. This past week, I've been able to attend a few of his sessions and have been very encouraged and pleased. His theme has been navigating life. He's used road signs, one way, yield, merge, right turn, diverge. And we are pleased to bring him to the pulpit at Union Springs Academy Church. Our scripture reading that he has asked to read here this morning is found in Daniel chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, and I read from the New King James Version. Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Kind of like Gail there as she told her children's story this morning. Then the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everybody. I believe we're on here. As I expressed last night, it's been a uh, blessing and a privilege to have been here at Union Springs Academy this week. Uh, I've really enjoyed my time with the students. I pray that they've enjoyed their time with me. Um, we've had a, a great time interacting with each other and playing basketball and eating lunch and all the different things I've tried to uh, involve in. So. All good things must come to an end. I need to get home to my wife, and uh, you all have to continue with what you're doing. So we praise God just for this time that we've had here. And uh, let's pray that the Lord will continue to bless us as we go forward in his word and in ministry. Let's bow our heads briefly. Father, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for the word. Thank you for what you've been doing here on this campus this week. 
We pray now that as we open your word again, that you would give us uh, not just understanding, not just knowledge, but that you would provide transform transformation for us today. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're living in a world in turmoil. We can all see it. Uh, it can't be denied and it can't be questioned. Our world is running out of control. Our world is spiraling out of control. Just the events of this very week have proven to us the extent to which this world is in trouble. The number of natural disasters per year has been rising dramatically on all continents since the year of 1980. But the trend is steepest for North America, where countries have been battered by hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, searing heat, and drought. The report finds that weather disasters in North America are among the worst and most volatile in the world. North America is the continent, studies have shown, with the largest increases in natural disasters. We've seen an increase in terrorism and violence. Of course, the events of this week have substantiated this. And Terrorism in general has quadrupled since the year 2001. Things are not getting better, things are getting worse. Steady increase of violent crimes in the U.S. every year and really all around the world. Things are not getting better, they are getting worse. There are wars and rumors of wars. Uh, Iran and Iraq and turmoil in Egypt, Palestine, Israel, all of these different countries are uh, there's always a question of what's going on and what's going to happen. Things are not getting better, but things are getting worse. And so the question is, what's going on? What's going on and how long can these things last? Is there hope in the midst of this turmoil? Well, we believe that the Bible gives us hope today. Interesting enough, this children's story dealt with dreams, and uh, the pastor asked, did you all coordinate this? I said, no, I didn't. This is the Holy Spirit that works things out like that. Um, so, in our text and in our passage, we read about King Nebuchadnezzar that had dreamed a dream. He dreamed this dream, and uh, I've had many experiences quite opposite to one that the children's story was told, where we dreamed a dream, but then you wake up and you do not remember. You can't remember for the life of you what you dreamed about. What was I, what was that dream? And sometimes it's, it's sort of, it's murky in there, you know you dream something, you maybe have a foggy idea of what it was about, but you do not remember the details. You don't remember what was going on. Nebuchadnezzar is in this predicament here. He says, I had this dream. He knew that it was a troubling dream. It was a bad dream. It was a dream that had disturbed him, but he can't exactly remember what it was. Now, he knew it was important enough that he needed to remember, and so he calls together his wise men. He calls together his astrologers and his magicians, and he says, look, I need you not just to interpret the dream, but I need for you to tell me what it was I dreamed. And the astrologers and the wise men said, now look, they could, have, they could have filibustered their way through a dream interpretation. We can always pick apart a dream and we can try to apply different things to it. Anybody can kind of uh, weasel their way through that. But when they said, when he said, I need you to tell me what it was I dreamed, well, they found out that they're in a predicament because we can't, uh, they said, King, who can tell you these things? Who knows what was in your head? And so then he gets upset and says, all right, off with all of your heads. Off with all of your heads. But the prophet Daniel, who had made himself known, and we talked about Daniel earlier this week with, with the students, who had been placed uh, strategically by God in a position to be a witness and a light in this pagan and heathen nation of Babylon to be a witness and to be a light and was placed in a high position in the kingdom. Daniel comes and he says, now, uh, king, hold on a little while. Let me go to my God and let me see if he will tell me uh, the interpretation of your dream. The king gives him the time. Daniel comes back and the God reveals to him not just what he dreamed, but then the interpretation. And so we believe that God is the God of revealing mysteries. And that's what Daniel tells the king Nebuchadnezzar. And so the king's dream was that of an image, that of a statue. The statue is made up of different uh, natural earthly materials. The head of gold, the chest and arms of silver, thighs of bronze, and legs of iron. And finally, feet, mixed with, feet and toes mixed with iron and clay. Daniel makes it very clear in chapter 
chapter 2 and verse 37, that these sections, all of these different metals, represent different kingdoms that will follow each other in succession with Babylon being the first. You, O king, are the head of gold, he tells Nebuchadnezzar. Babylon is the head of gold. And these other metals that come after are kingdoms that will come after you that will be less in impact and that will be less in influence and less in strength. So you are the greatest, and gold symbolizes pomp and splendor, and history tells us that Babylon was laden with gold, and the temples were built with gold. And so God is using symbols that were relevant to the times, and so the people reading would say, all right, I understand why, what is going on here. Finally, Medo-Persia Medo comes on the scene and conquers Babylon with the chest and arms of silver. And we know that from history that in 539 BC, that Babylon fell to this kingdom of Medo-Persia. Following Medo-Persia, we see that Greece came on the scene. In 331 BC, Alexander the Great conquered Medo-Persia. And the Greek military was known for its bronze armory, its armor, its shields, and weapons. Finally, after Greece, the legs of iron. In 168 BC, Rome conquered Greece and overthrew their empire. Legs are the longest part of the body in the same way Rome had the longest reign of any of these kingdoms. Iron is the strongest metal and Rome was the strongest empire. Rome was known for ruling with an iron hand. And so God is not just selecting random uh, metals and random things just to put them there. He is selecting things that were relevant and that were consistent with history. And we see the divided empire, the feet and toes of iron and clay represent the divided Roman Empire, the barbarian tribes that overthrew the Western Roman Empire and divided into the separate nations of Europe and also representing the governments in existence when Christ returns, symbolized by the rock smashing into the feet and into the toes. Through this prophecy, through this prophecy given in Daniel 2 from God to Nebuchadnezzar through Daniel, God has given us a direct outline of the major empires in human history. Written 500 years before Christ, this prophecy is proven true and accurate in every way. This tells us that we can be absolutely and unequivocally certain that the Bible is true and that prophecy can be trusted. This also gives us a glimpse of how Bible prophecy works. We can see from this prophecy that it was not only fulfilled in Daniel's day, the prophecy which began in Daniel's day uh, carries on its fulfillment and unfolds all throughout history, even down to our time today. The question becomes, where should we put our trust? Why should we trust in God? Well, I just have a few points and then I'll sit down. First, we should trust in God because God is in control of the world's history and the world's events. He sets up and tears down kings and kingdoms. Daniel 1 verse uh, 1 and 2 describes the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. This tells us the Lord was instrumental in the conquering of Babylon from Israel. The Lord was the one that set Nebuchadnezzar up. And eventually, the Lord is the one that will set Nebuchadnezzar down. The Lord is in charge of kings and kingdoms. We also find that he reveals all mysteries, including the future. In chapter 2, verse 28, uh, Daniel tells us, But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these, and he proceeds to unfold the vision. Daniel needs to let Nebuchadnezzar know that God not only is in control of you, Nebuchadnezzar, he's in control of your kingdom and your reign. You didn't get here on your own. You didn't get here on your own. You were put here and placed here by God for a purpose. Daniel also reveals to him that he reveals the mysteries of the future. We serve a God that is not just confined by time, who is not confined by the past, nor is he confined to the present, but also exists in the future before it has happened. And so he glimpses forward and nothing surprises him, nothing takes him by, uh, nothing catches him off guard. We know a God and we serve a God that is the God of history and of the future. And finally, we see that God is in control as his sovereignty is unquestionable. God is the one 
that sets it all up, that tears it all down. He is from the beginning and to the end. God is in control of the world's history and events. That's a good reason to trust him, isn't it? To serve a God that does not, that is not confined by time, that knows what's going to happen and has chosen now to reveal to his people exactly what is to come to pass so that we may be prepared in these final days. So we trust God and we should serve God because he is in control of the world's events and history. We also trust him because he will eventually destroy all the earthly kingdoms and will judge and will sit on the throne as judge. And you know what? I don't want anybody else judging but God. I wouldn't trust anybody else. A God who can see within the depths of the human heart, who cannot just judge. Now we have to, when we go in our court systems today and the judge has to look at, and the jury has to look at evidence and it has to be proven beyond what? A reasonable doubt. They have to find the evidence and they have to match it up with forensics and DNA and all of these different things. And sometimes, and we talked about this earlier this week as well, students, sometimes the guilty don't get punished. Sometimes the guilty get off and sometimes the innocent get punished. It's just what happens because we're dealing with external evidence. But we serve a God that looks into the depths of the human heart and can read motives and can read the thoughts of man. And so we don't have to worry about what, uh, who did what and who didn't do what. And we also understand that we're all guilty anyway. All of us are guilty and have fallen under the curse of sin. But well, praise be to God through Jesus Christ that he came and died and suffered in our place so that we may have life. But God is the ultimate judge. He says he will destroy all earthly kingdoms. We see that in verse 35. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is a description, a symbolic description of the kingdom of God. That stone that comes out, the second coming of Christ when he returns and God will set up his kingdom after he has destroyed the kingdoms of this earth. God's judgment is inevitable. This is not a conditional prophecy. There are prophecies that we find in the Bible that uh, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, then I will turn my face and I will hear them and I will turn from uh, my wrath. There's if then prophecies. If you do this, then this will happen. If you don't do this, then this will happen. Then there are prophecies that will happen. No if or then about it. This is one of those prophecies. God said, I will establish my kingdom on earth. I will come again. I will destroy this earth and I will create it new. There's no if thens about it. It is going to happen. And so that's why we don't put our trust in the things of this world. And that's why we don't put our trust in the kingdoms of this world. Our trust and security does not lie with the Department of Homeland Security. It does not lie with TSA, the CIA, or the FBI, or any other abbreviated uh, security uh, offices. Or full body airport scanners. Our security lies in the one who is the master of history. Our security lies in the fact that God says, I am coming again and I will deal with the earth. God will judge these kingdoms uh, for all that they have done, all they have neglected to do. God's judgment is fair and righteous. And the Bible tells us that at the end of time that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and everyone will come to the realization and the understanding that God was indeed just and he was indeed fair in his judgments. We trust God finally because he will set up a new kingdom. This kingdom is a supernatural kingdom. It's a God-made kingdom. Not man-made, so it won't have man-made problems. We won't have to deal with pollution. We won't have to deal with death and crime and poverty and disease and injustice and uh, oppression and genocide and homicide and any other sides. All we'll have to deal with is the presence of God. This kingdom is eternal. Verse 44 in Daniel 2 tells us, In the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it will stand forever. It's not a temporary situation. All the other nations, all the other kingdoms that Daniel described in this vision, in this dream, they came to an end. He told Nebuchadnezzar, 
You are the head of gold, but you will not last forever. After you will come another, and after them will come another. When Nebuchadnezzar had a problem with this, and he tried to erect an image completely of gold, and trying to say that, you know, no, Babylon, my kingdom will last forever. And God told him, no, you will not last forever. See, God was on a journey with Nebuchadnezzar, reminding him that he is not, in fact, in control, that God is in control. This kingdom is eternal. It is not a temporary situation. It is not, it will not fade and no one will conquer it. It will last forever. So we won't have to worry about invading nations. We won't have to worry about terrorists. We won't have to worry about homeland security because God will be there. This is good news, isn't it? This kingdom finally is for everybody. It won't be just for one uh, one group, one ethnicity, one religion, one whatever. This will be a kingdom for everybody. All nations, all kindreds, all tongues, and all peoples, as the Bible describes in Revelation. A number that no man can number. It will be so great and so vast that it will stretch forward. And John says, I can't even count, I can't even estimate how many people th this is when he sees it in Revelation. This kingdom will be for everybody that has accepted and has embraced the message and the grace of Jesus Christ. And finally, this kingdom will begin soon. The stone comes and crashes into the feet and into the toes. And as we follow the progression of the image, we see it goes from Babylon to Medo-Persia to Greece to Rome to the divided Roman Empire and all the way down to the end of human history, we must conclude that we are in the toenails of time. We're all the way down in the toenails of human history. In other words, there's nothing else to come after this. There is no uh, second dispensation. There is nothing else to come. There, in fact, it says there is no major world empire that will come on the scene after this one. This is it. We don't have anything else to look forward to except that rock that will come down and smash these kingdoms to dust, and that is Christ returning himself. We are in the toenails of time. That lets me know that Jesus Christ is coming soon. That lets me know how long will we have to deal with this? Not long. How long will we have to experience uh, eight-year-olds dying in bombs by, by random people? Not long. How long will we have to continue to dwell and deal with these struggles of sin in our lives? Not long. This tells me that Christ is coming very soon. Beloved, we are in the toenails of time. And things may look bad now. But Daniel 2, in this image, in this dream, in the Bible, promises us that the rock will come and will smash this earthly kingdom. God is worthy of our trust because he is sovereign and he is in control. Trust will come only through relationship. We don't just trust him uh, just like we don't trust each other based on superficial relationship. Trust is built by time. Trust is built by investment. And if there's anything that I would have left with the students this week, it's that to build a relationship with God, we have to spend time, we have to put forth effort, and we have to trust him. And so I'd like to call all of us to deepen our relationship and to deepen our trust with God. If that's your desire, just stand to your feet and we'll have prayer. We want to trust him more. We want a deeper relationship with him. We want to be ready when Jesus comes again. And we believe he's coming very soon. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you so much. We thank you that you are the God that sees beyond the confines of time. We thank you that we don't have to worry about the future, for you have revealed it to us. We thank you that we don't have to deal with the uncertainty of what is going to happen and when it's going to happen. We know that you are coming soon. You have given us a sure word of prophecy concerning the things to come to pass on this earth. And since you have warned us, Lord, we pray that we will be prepared and that we will be ready. And our preparation comes by deepening our relationship and our trust in you. You see these that have stood confessing that, Lord, we want a deeper relationship with you. We want a deeper trust experience with you. So I pray that you will honor it and that this is what you will do for us. Bless each and every one of us this day. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
God bless you. You may be seated. Our closing song will be hymn number 213, Jesus is Coming Again. thank you for this service and this time that we've had today. May We pray that we may never, as we depart from this place, we may not depart from your presence, but that you'll be with us wherever we go. Bless us now and help us to return uh, this evening for the events uh, to take place. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>